OK, hi, I'm Sarah. I'm a BCS first year PhD student. And the work I'm presenting today is largely owing to the collaboration with Jason Fisher, Nancy Kanwisher, and Josh Tenenbaum. So as other presentations have mentioned today, intuitive physical understanding of the world around us is crucial for interaction and crucial for moving through the world. And so this internal physical simulation not only helps us make physical inferences and predictions about objects we're not directly interacting with, such as is this a good place to set my computer? Or is it safe for the child to climb on this tree branch? Or is he too heavy? But it also helps us plan actions we're going to take on objects, such as, is it a good idea for me to take the lime at the bottom of the stack? Or should I reach for the one on the top? Or which of these sets of weights do we think are heavier, the ones on the top or the ones on the bottom? And how do I prepare my muscles accordingly? Humans are actually surprisingly good at making these types of inferences, as can be demonstrated in psychophysical experiments. And even infants under a year of age can tell the difference between solids and liquids and make inferences about mass from other physical cues. Jess Hamrick, uh, when, our, when in our department, designed a set of stimuli to test this psychophysically in toppling tower experiments such as this one. And this is something you can do from your seat. Look at this tower and try and determine whether or not it would collapse onto the green or the red side of the table if it were to topple. We can model human behavioral predictions and behavioral inferences about this tower using physics engines similar to those in video games and complex computer graphics. But we also want to know what the brain basis is for this intuitive physical inference. Jason Fisher, while in this department, did some preliminary work in the scanner to look at the brain basis of intuitive physical reasoning. And first, contrasted physical inference tasks with difficulty match tasks not involving physical reasoning. So if you remember our tower experiment from a moment ago, you could contrast a physics judgment, which direction would the tower fall, with a color task, such as how many blue versus how many yellow uh, blocks are in the tower. And when that's run in the scanner, what we find is increased activation for the physics task in a number of subregions of the multiple demand network, premotor areas and parietal regions that have been implicated in tool use. But to test that this increased activation isn't only owing to the spatial content of these videos, Jason did another task in the scanner where subjects watched uh, these two-dimensional interactions, either purely physical or involving some social component where you see the balls chase each other around in two dimensions, right? And what the subjects would have to do is make some inference as to the location of the dot that disappears after the end of the movie. So we see increased activation in the same subregions of multiple demand network uh, for the physical task over the social task here. And so we've got activation here not only in these types of physical inference tasks, but also in action planning and grasp planning in these networks and in passive viewing. So you have subregions of multiple demand network implicated in physical inference action planning, and passive viewing of physics. So these three things in concert suggest that these regions are good candidates for a potential physics engine in the brain. But the follow-up question naturally is whether they represent information that would be necessary for a physics engine. And so I'm investigating this currently in the scanner from the standpoint of mass and looking to see if these regions encode massive objects across a number of different scenarios in an event-related paradigm in the scanner. And so I look at three different physical scenarios where the mass of a set of objects is represented through its interaction with its environment, but not explicitly stated. And the subjects have to make some physical inference based on cues in the video as to the mass of each of the objects. I've got five different types of shapes and then three different masses, a light, medium, and a heavy for each shape. And the masses interact in three different types of scenarios a water displacement scenario where the more massive objects will make a larger splash in the water, blowing where the larger masses are more difficult to blow across a flat surface, and a bouncing scenario where the heavier masses displace a bouncy mat more. And we want to see if mass information is represented abstractly so we could decode across scenarios. Moving forward, bearing a couple questions in mind regarding these physics regions, we want to know if not only mass, they represent other physical quantities that could be important for inference, such as friction, inertia, collisions, et cetera. 
After that, I'm very curious about how this physics is learned and to what extent this physics engine is a learned thing. And to investigate this, I'm curious to look at physics violations and examples of unintuitive physics, where objects behave in physical ways that we might not necessarily expect. And lastly, because we saw that the implicated regions are important in physical inference, action planning, and passive viewing, I'm curious what the relationship is between humans' potential to interact with the world and this intuitive physical simulation, and whether or not this potential for action is crucial for learning physics and how that coupling plays out. Thank you. <laughs>